Chapter 9 Nighttime aboard the Hornswaggle was magical. A blazing sunset turned the clouds pink and the lakes orange. Then the sky opened up to reveal a universe of stars. The blue buccaneers clothed their guests in bandanas and blankets to protect them against the chill air before seating themselves around the central balloon furnace for a fireside meal. The glow lit their jolly faces as they shared in good food, steaming coffee, and molasses cookies dipped in crystal sugar. Just as George and Tanith were about to nod off to sleep, the pirates suddenly got to their feet and disappeared into the captain's quarters. One by one, they emerged to join the circle with their instrument of choice. Both Dog and Dragon's ears perked up as the first notes were played. The phoenix chittered excitedly. Captain Tom chose last, taking his seat with a dazzling guitar made of polished silver. In its surface, you could see the fire, the stars, and the faces of dear friends. He strummed it with their reverence, owed a harp, closing his eyes to feel the sound. As he began to play, the blue buccaneers accompanied him. Listen well, ye who seek the dragon's gold, for I'll tell you the tale of a young lad so bold. He set out to find a dragon's lair. With a griffin's help, he took to the air. The lair lies deep, beyond the mist and sea, where secrets are kept and mystery be. Over the misty sea, they flew with ease, and saw dangers as could bring sailors to their knees. The siren song, so haunting and pure, will lead ye astray of that ye can be sure. The Kraken's arms, so big and strong, drag ships to the depths and crew along. And then they came to a maze so grand, where twists and turns were so unplanned. The brave young lad saw dangers unknown that would leave ye lost and on your own. With the griffin's help, they made their way, and soon they found themselves in a dragon's cave. A cavern of riches, dull and time-worn. The home of the dragon, the mighty Pangborn. A terrifying beast, so fearsome and red, with scales bright as fire upon his head. His lair was filled with gold and jewels so bright, a sight that could make any pirate's heart take flight. And the young lad, so brave and true, knew that staying meant death would ensue. So he turned and fled with the griffin in tow, leaving Pangborn's lair and treasure aglow. Listen well, ye who seek adventure and fame, for danger and riches, they come hand in hand, the same. But know when to leave, when danger draws near. For the treasure be grand, but your life is more dear. So if ye dare to face the dragon's scales, remember the lad who fled and prevailed. For though the reward may be bright and red, the blood of the dragon is not worth the dead. Dog and Drake listened in rapt silence, astonished by what they'd heard. They did not speak until the musical buccaneers placed their instruments on their laps for a moment's rest. Tell us, Captain Tom, George inquired, is the tale in the song a true one? Aye, the dragon shanty is sung and believed by all sea dogs in these parts, the bearded man said. Tanith could hardly sit still. The great dragon's name is Pangborn, she exclaimed. The shanty is a map to his cave. We do not have far to go, do we, George? Shiver me timbers, Captain Tom cried with a great laugh. <laughs> Are ye scallywags on a treasure hunt? Indeed we are. The dog replied. We are on a quest to visit the dragon terrorizing the lands for one reason or another. Have you seen him? The pirates shuddered at the memory. Aye, that we have, Captain Tom said. He swooped in and carried off Old Salt, whose given name was George. A fine pianist, if ever there was one. And we still see the rapscallion flying by to this day. We expect to see him again soon, when his nap is done. 
Tanith became quite worried listening to this. She looked around at the pirates, still mourning the loss of their friend. Are you also in search of Lord Pangborn's hoard of gold and jewels you sang about? She asked nervously. Do you wish for vengeance? Everyone stared at her in surprise. Then they burst out hooting and hollering. Captain Tom gave his own humorous roar before answering. <laughs> we would never venture so far from the Spring Lakes where our beloved Hornswaggle flies best, he explained. Nor would I endanger my crew just to sneak a few doubloons from beneath a dragon's claw. Pangborn is larger than imagination, and there be rumors on the air that only a man by the name of George can slay the beast. You'd be better off searching for him than the cave, mark my words. Although you are not looking to slay a dragon, George said, perhaps you would be interested in flying us across the sea mentioned in the song. We find ourselves without a helpful griffin. The captain thought about it, stroking his auburn beard, then leapt to his feet. His leather boots hit the deck with a wonderful whack. The blue buccaneers looked up at him with hunger in their eyes as they quickly deduced what he had in mind. All at once, they took up their tools and launched into a pirate's anthem, both grand and moving. Soon everyone was on their feet, pounding out the rhythm while fiddling, striking, and honking. Even the phoenix squawked in time. George and Tanith got up to dance, whirling about and barking with excitement, intoxicated by the sailor's fervor and song. Let's hoist the sail and set a course. We'll make for the maze with no remorse, with swords in hand and hearts so bold. We'll take our friends to the dragon's home. We'll sail the sea with the wind so fair, and brave the kraken with nary a care. The siren's songs they'll try to lure, but our hearts are strong and we'll endure. Through twists and turns, they'll find the way to where Dragon Pangborn spends his day. They'll face the dragons both far and near, and take the spoils without any fear. And when the day is done, and they have won, we'll sing this shanty till our journey's done. For pirates we are, and adventure we seek. With each new journey, our spirits do peak. So come, me hearties, and join the fray, for treasure and glory await us today. At first light, the pirates fired up the balloons and unfurled the sails. George and Tanith did their best to stay out of the way as the crew raced around in a practiced waltz across the deck of the Hornswaggle. Captain Tom stomped around bellowing orders, the phoenix clinging to his shoulder. Aye, aye, aye. The crew responded each time. New blue paint was applied, fuel was loaded into the three furnaces, polka dot patches were sewn into place, supplies was secured, and a course was set for the hazy sea. Being aboard the flying ship was already spectacular, but it was much more exhilarating when the sails were out. The hornswaggle caught powerful gusts that pushed it toward the horizon. Standing on the deck, Tanith hopped onto the parapet and dug her claws in to feel the rush across her green scales. She liked the color a little better now that she had seen the beauty of the spring lakes. Do you miss the summer lands? The baby dragon asked her companion. George put his paws up to look over the side, down to where herons flew. Every day, he confirmed. Do you miss your home? The closest I ever had to a home was a spring country a long way from here, Tanith said. I was the only egg hatched that no one was pleased to see, out of place and too green. When I heard stories about a red dragon with a giant horde, I knew I had to meet him and ask that he teach me the best way to be a dragon. As George and Tanith watched the world turn beneath them, an endless landscape of pools and rivers, they saw something different up ahead. What looked like a mirage slowly grew as the hornswaggle surged towards it. An expanse of water replaced the grassy watershed of flowering cherry trees and pussy willow. All of a sudden, the spring lakes were overtaken by tumultuous waves of salt water. Nothing else was visible within miles of flying over the rocky shore, for the sea was wrapped in the promised fog from the old legend sung by the captain. The hornswaggle was enveloped by the mist until it was impossible to see ahead, behind, or side to side. Only the sloshing waves were clear. Captain Tom hollered to his crew, and the blue buccaneers dimmed the furnaces with masterful skill. 
the ship sank lower and lower in the sky. Then with one final lurch, it plopped into the water with a great slap against the hull. Everyone worked quickly to gather the deflated balloon sacks and store them away. Look there, Meaty, the captain said to Tanith, pointing into the swirling gray. Beware. George's floppy ears perked up, and he lifted one paw to point into the unknown. The baby dragon swiveled her own cow-like ears until she understood what they were hearing. Singing. It was the strangest, most ethereal sound ever to touch her heart. All at once, Tanith wanted to shout for joy, sob from anguish, growl from envy, and scream in pure rage. Someone is hurt, George said, a low growl in his throat. Tanith agreed. Captain, we must go to them. The old pirate shook his head gravely. Try not to listen too closely, me hearties, warned Captain Tom. Siren song is not really music. Ye must think of them as mere birds, nothing more. Loons whose sad cries make ye weep for no reason. Every one of the blue buccaneers looked ahead with stoic expressions as the piercing sound washed over the deck, stronger than stormy waves. Beneath the fog, the sea was calm, perfect for slow, easy sailing. Yet the helmsman had to concentrate to keep the bow straight. His task was complicated by craggy rocks that began to appear on either side of the hornswaggle, which would have been easily navigated were it not for the creatures sitting atop them. Mermaids, beautiful people with skin pale as a fish's belly and shiny tails where legs would have been. Even in the dim light of the hazy sea, they sparkled and shimmered with the rainbow gloss of mica. They reached out to the sailors as the hornswaggle passed, nearly missing the rocks. Their song grew louder and longer and ever more desolate in feeling. Their doll-like faces pleaded for aid. Just as George looked ready to jump off into the water to reach the poor creatures, Captain Tom stomped onto the deck with his silver guitar. He strummed it, and the robust sound carried through the damp air. These notes were a great relief and called the attention of everyone on board. As he began to sing, his crew rushed to find their own instruments. Born to a stonemason, youngest of three, heard the pirates call, dreamt of the sea. With salt on his skin and winds in his hair, he left for adventure with nary a care. His ship was his home, the crew his kin. Together they sailed through thick and thin. His laugh was hearty, his smile so bright. Yet he hunted for treasure with all of his might. A map he found, faded and gray. A coffer to seek, a price to pay. He followed its path with hope in his heart. But it led him astray and tore him apart. He pursued his prize alone and afraid, and with each cresting wave his sanity frayed. Now his ship is adrift, his crew have withdrawn, his treasure is lost, yet his hope is not gone. He rode the wind, seeking fortune and fame, landlocked no more, feeling no shame. The sea is his grave, a sad lullaby, for the young lad who dared, and then said goodbye. Fearsome captain of legends, his heart made of stone. Now lost to the waves, without love, all alone. Captain Tom belted out this melancholic melody with such passion that the sirens stopped their own wailing to listen. The little white dog howled in time to a harmonica, longing to see his master again. The orphaned dragon sniffled till her green face was streaked with indigo tears. The accompaniment continued until the danger was behind the hornswaggle, and silence fell upon the deck, echoing in the mist. I wonder if Lord Pangborn feels like that, Tanith murmured, alone in his cave with only his horde.